If you ask me who my God is, on whose name I call, if you ask me who my God is, He's the God of us all, Allah the Merciful. If you ask me what my book is that I hold in my hand, if you ask me what my book is, it's the Holy Quran, the Holy Quran. Mm-hmm. Salaam alaikum and peace, and welcome to this episode of Misconceptions. My name is Muhammad Hashim, and with us in the studio today we have Sheikh Yuf- Yusuf Estes. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. We also have in the studio our studio audience. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Today, inshallah, in our show Misconceptions, we are going to talk about something very important: punishments. So, the misconceptions of punishment in Islam, and some of the different punishments in Islam. So, Sheikh, how can we start talking about punishment? It's, I guess, reward, punishment, you know, there Well, has to actually, be... you know, this is a very important topic mm. and one that needs to be presented for Muslims as well as those who are not Muslims. Inshallah. Because there is a lot of information being offered on the Internet, the media, television, all the broadcast media out there are talking about this topic. What we will say immediately, if you ask, is there punishment in Islam? The answer is emphatically, yes, there is. But also, as we've said in many of our programs, Islam is offering what's called al-mizan. There's a balance. There is a balance between punishment and reward. Now, what's very interesting, the psychiatrists tell us, that the human being's makeup in the brain works off of two stimuli. There are only two reasons why a human being does anything. That's either for a hope of a reward or the fear of a loss. So understanding that, this is how we're made up. This is what we do. Well, I'm not going to do anything unless I, unless I think I'm going to get something or I'm going to protect something from being lost. That's the motivators. They narrowed it down to that. Very interesting. Now, let's go to a step further. How does that work in religion? Well, for sure, in the monotheistic faiths of Adam, Abraham, Moses, David, Suleiman, Jesus Christ, peace be upon all of them, and Muhammad, there is this clear teaching of a reward called paradise and a punishment called hell. So, for sure, all the monotheistic religions are insisting on a reward if you do good stuff, and a punishment if you do bad stuff. Clear? This is the motivator behind everything we do in Islam as well. So there's not something brand new here. But when we begin to look at what people do, when they try to interpret some of these things and put it in a more practical level, we find that either we go too far or not far enough. And that's where we lose our balance. Okay. One of the things we might do right now is ask our studio audience for some input. What are some of the things, brothers, that you may have seen or heard people ask you about punishments in Islam? Yeah, yes, question. brother, go ahead. Uh, some people say, beat, beat your wives. So is it in Quran? Beat your wives. Mm. Well, that's definitely a punishment question. It's something we've dealt with in other, other programs, talking about women and marriage and so on, but it's appropriate to bring it up again. Does it mean beat your wives as punishment for something wrong? Is that right? Absolutely. Okay. It's what it's talking about. Yeah. Now, in Islam, what we do know is our Prophet, peace be upon him, forbid us to do that. Prior to Islam, men used to treat their women in the worst way. And the culture was such that a woman had no rights, no opportunity for a redress of grievances. She would be punished according to the whatever her master slash husband is going to dish out. And nobody would intervene. Nobody would stand up for her. She's just going to have to endure whatever happens. In some cases, they beat them to death. So the, the, when Islam comes, it's making it clear this is forbidden. One of the things we talked about was when the Arabs take their daughters to the desert and bury them alive. There's a verse in the Quran saying that on the Day of Judgment, they're going to say, well, for what sin was I killed? So we see that Islam is bringing an end to that horrible 
mistreatment in that culture. Additionally, that the women were not to be beaten. The verse that's often misquoted and misunderstand is in Surah An-Nisa. That's chapter 4, verse 34. We've, again, we've discussed it before, but it's worth it to mention it again. The term is used, Wadribahuna. And this is referring to feminine, or in the case of this word, Daraba. Daraba is, um, first of all, it's difficult to pronounce if you're not an Arab because it has the ba in it. Daraba. <laughs> Daraba. Mm. But this is a wide word, wider than any word we have in English. For instance, in English, if I'm walking, I would never use the word hit or strike. I might say the way my foot struck the pavement. But I, I don't really say my shoe hit the floor unless I dropped it or something. And so hitting and striking, another term it's used is scourge. Well, that doesn't work either. But this word daraba is so big it includes what happens when you swing and don't connect. When you swing at something you don't connect, it's still considered daraba. But we carry it to another level. And here is something that you find in colloquial English more so, but it will translate. And that's when Allah says it in the Quran in chapter 14, verse 24. That's Surah Ibrahim. And Allah says, Alam tara kaifa daraballahu methla kalama tayyaba. I'll stop there so you can get the feel of it. Don't you see how Allah hit you with a good word? The word methla now says like. So we'll go back and read it again. Don't you see how Allah hits you with something like a good word? Like a good word. How does that work? Well, in English we would say, for instance... Somebody's asking you, let's go somewhere. We're going to go get a pizza? You say, yeah, but I would rather have uh, tacos. How does that idea hit you? Hmm. That's the word darba now. Hmm. So it could be that you're trying to get an idea across. You're trying to get somebody to understand. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, when scholars were later asked about this, they were being asked, could this be interpreted as being physical contact? And some of the scholars said, yes, but no more than this. And they used a tooth stick and tapped on their arm. No more than this and tapped on their arm. Now, on our website about this subject, if you go to islamswomen.com, you'll find that we have talked about it in details that it could be no more than what's called percuss in English. That's when a doctor examines your upper torso, puts his hand on your chest, he taps his own hand. Okay, okay. okay that could be percuss. But more than anything, read it in the context. If you observe, Allah is saying, nushuza, a, a bizarre condition, a rebellion of the wife. If you observe a rebellion of the wife, in this case... It's saying, don't beat her, because that's what they used to do. It's saying, instead, tell her. Tell her about it. Admonish her about this thing, this rebellion against what she's to do as a Muslim. And then, if she doesn't comply, leave her bed. Don't have intimate contact with her. So this implies over a period of time. That there's no way that it could be done out of hostile emotion coming from somebody if he's waited a week <laughs> he's still seeing the same act coming from her behavior is not increased in a good way it hasn't improved so he's admonished her he stayed away from her in bed and now but if they comply and come back in the way they should be then leave them alone and forget about it so what does it mean right here and that's where some people put, especially in English translations, some very harsh terms. Yeah. But in fact, it's impossible in Islam that anybody could beat his wife and be complying with the teachings of Muhammad. Peace be upon him. Because it, on one occasion, somebody was asking about getting married to one of two men. And uh, one of them, he mentioned, and we never talk bad about anybody, but in this case you have to. And he said, in the case of this man, I don't recommend him because he beat his wife. So it was clear, it was clear that that's not right. Another thing he said in his famous last speech to the people, that you must not beat your wives. And in another saying, he said, the best of you are the best to your wives, and I'm the best of you 
to my wives. Oh, wow. So we see again and again this insistence on not beating and being good. Right. So how do you how do you <coughs> come up with a new meaning? It's because you gave the wrong meaning to baraba. So if you said it means to admonish her harder, yes. If, suppose that you have a cat that jumps up on the table. You don't want him on the table. Well, you don't take a whip and crack it over his head or or something like that. Instead, what you would do is take a newspaper and slap your own hand with it, okay? Or crack your hands together like this, and that sound, that's what would make them understand that you're upset, you need to move uh, off the table. In the same way, you're letting her know with some impact, but never, ever to beat them, never. never. And those who say otherwise, I invite them to sit with real scholars as I have and ask again and again. And the word they came up with in this case was percuss. Thank you very much, Sheikh. Okay, we're going to go to a quick break, inshallah. And when we do return, we're going to talk about misconceptions of punishments right after the break, inshallah. Hopefully we'll discuss some, some tips on, on how to increase the, the ability of getting the du'a or the supplication answered. Allah delays giving you what you want and gives you a reward that is equal to that or better in this life or in the world to come uh, for giving you your sins and giving you good deeds. I'm going to look at some questions that we've asked some of our brothers on the street. Uh, we asked them, should Muslims have a dialogue with other religions? We're going to need some stability. So. We, uh, it doesn't matter where we live, we need to care for those ones to give them the rights that Allah gives them. This life is not the eternal life, it is a test. Particularly for the youth of today. So if there are any parents or uncles or whoever is watching, if you have 16, 17, 18, 20 year olds with you, make sure they stop doing whatever they're doing and come in and watch this show, inshallah. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to this show of misconceptions. Well, our misconception for today is punishments. So what are we up to in punishments this year? Well, already we've talked about a misconception people have about being able to beat wives. That never has been a part of Islam. And even though some people may do that, it's against the teachings of Islam. It's very clear. So I think that gets rid of that one. I'd like to take another question from the audience. Who has a question? Yes, I, I have questions. Okay. Question. Yes, sir. Tell us what your question is, uh, please. Did Prophet say beat your children? The Prophet Muhammad said beat your children? Yeah. Is that, is that the question? Yeah. Whoa. All right. What do we say about that, Shay? Ah, uh, there is a hadith. I do know about a hadith that mentions the word baraba. The word we were saying just before the break, we were talking about the meaning of baraba. In it, yes, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was telling us about children praying. And again, this is a case where people go to extremes. Watch this. He told us, peace be upon him, to have your children pray when they reach the age of seven. And at the age of ten, daraba them. So if you put beat in there, you can see where they would think, oh, you have to beat your kids if they don't pray. And I have heard people interpret it that way. But actually, we'll go back and look at something. One of the problems we see amongst the Muslims today, they think it's so cute when their children copy them in the prayers. So a two-year-old or a three-year-old, they want them to stand and pray with them. Well, the child likes that. They're copying their parents. By the time they're four, they're doing it all the time. By the time they're five, they're like, I don't want to do it anymore. No, you have to. By the time they're seven, they're saying, yeah, this is not fun. You know, I've been doing this. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't understand it. Because they don't know even what the prayer is about. They just know their father does it. They it know their mom them. does it. Mm. Now, if the children want to do it, absolutely don't stop them. But at seven, you encourage them to start learning about how to do it. And by the time they're 10, 
Now, where does the word darba fit in? Again, let's go back to the meaning of admonish or make clear to them and give them an example. Give them the example. You should be praying. You should be doing it yourself. And you should be telling them, hey, it's time to pray. Come on. Come on. Come over here right now. Okay, that's the most you could do. From what because age? Sake? From what age? At it, it, seven years old, seven encouraging years. them. Then at ten years old, that's when the word darba was used in the hadith or the saying of Muhammad. But never would it be possible to understand him to say beat a child because he himself never allowed people to even beat animals. He did not allow people to beat children. He was so much against that. It, it is so sad that people are trying to accuse Islam of the very thing Islam came to protect, people's rights, people's dignity, people's honor, and the right to enjoy your your freedoms. Mm. Islam is about that. Let's take another question. I, I like that. Let's keep going. I have a question. Yes. My, for, question, my question is fornication. Why does Islam say whip them? To whip the fornicators. Yes. To whip them. Okay, now this, is, this definitely is a, a type of beating. Without any doubt, this is physical punishment. Yeah. Because the crime has been committed now. Before, this was not, these were not crimes. This is a crime. A crime against a person, what they did to themselves, what they've done to another person, and a crime that they've done to the families, a crime they've done to the society. How so? Because in the Western world today, it's not a big deal at all. No. But it's a very big deal in Islam. The sanctity of virginity is something that's being lost on the mentality of a lot of the people of the West. Especially when we watch some of the movies and television shows, even commercials, almost promoting promiscuity to the level that the schools in my country are giving out condoms, prophylactics, to the children to take on their own. Don't even tell the parents these. They're saying, here, use these if you have sex. Now, imagine a sixth grader, a child 11 or 12 years old, and you're giving them this and telling them, you know, if you do it, be sure you use something like this. And you're thinking, whoa, this is not encouraging it? Hmm. Uh, it has to be. What are you doing? So... How do we understand this fornication and why would there be a punishment? If we go to the Old Testament of the Bible, we'll find it's very serious. Even to the extent of killing, depending on how it's done. Who did what to who could be stoning to death just for fornication. Okay. But in Islam, if the fornicators are caught, then they would be punished with 100 lashes. Now... There's a punishment, but there's a condition. The condition is there have to be four witnesses. eyewitnesses. Four people, adults, Muslim adults, have to see actual penetration itself and know the perpetrators. They have to know both the male and the female. They have to know both of them. They have to see it clearly. And they have to know that that's taking place on all at the same time. Not that one would see them today and one sees them tomorrow or 15 minutes later. No. It all set at the same time. Now here's the problem with that. Where in the world would you imagine somebody would see something like this and four people could be there witness to it? Sounds to me like a sideshow in a circus or something. <laughs> I don't know. But certainly not something that uh, anybody in their right from, mind yeah. would do out in the open. But it is a forbidden act. And the punishment for it is to be whipped. But if one of those four cannot collaborate the story of the other three, or if only three come, their testimony is not accepted anymore after that. And they are whipped, each one of them, with 80 lashes. 80 lashes. That's the punishment for them. Because they will say, even though three of you are saying the same story, in Islam we have to have a fourth. And the reason is we don't want girls and boys falsely accused of doing something that maybe they did, maybe they didn't. Because if they got really close to it but didn't actually do it, there isn't punishment. 
But of course, when people hear stories like this, they're going to stay away from it anyway. I mean, if somebody tells you there's a chance you could be whipped, you're going to be like, whoa, I'll stay yeah, exactly. far away from it. The misconception from a lot of non-Muslims, they can't understand why you can't have sex before marriage. They can't see the effects. Can you name some of the effects? Like you say, it ruins or affects the family and an immediate oh, yes. society. Uh, certainly. Just a couple you, of points. <clears throat> one of the things that it does, it takes away the virginity of both so that when they do get married, they are not having the satisfaction of knowing that their partner is pure and clean for them. And they don't have this hang-up in their mind thinking, what do you think? You're comparing me to somebody else. Maybe mm -hmm. I'm not this or you're not that. Or And so it opens the door immediately for arguments. Um, it opens the door to even divorce. And another thing that happens, there could be a child born from this relationship. And that's a very big reality. If a child is conceived and born from this relationship, um, it it could be disastrous because there's no marriage. Where does the child get his rights? No stability. He has nothing. His mother has a bad reputation immediately. Who is his father? This is another problem. She might marry another person. Now they got to split up home. His his foster father is this one, or stepdad is this one, and that man over there, or that guy over here. And this has a tremendous negative effect on a child as they grow up. And we can prove that again and again by case studies throughout the mental institutions, penal institutions all across the nation of the United States. And I know I've worked in those places as a chaplain. I've met people who didn't know who their father was and their mother didn't know who her father was. Now, what kind of society is that? And where do you think these guys were that I met? In prison. In prison. And one told me, I'm in prison, my father's in another prison, and my mother's in another prison. If that isn't spelling something out, I don't know what is. If this is clear, very clear, the damage that you're doing through this promiscuity. There were other things, drugs involved and so, but this is definitely something leading up to it. Okay, sure. So the punishment, can you summarize some, some more of the punishments? Is well, that... the, as I said before, if there are not eyewitnesses, hmm. then that doesn't happen anyway. But there are other things involved, too, okay. that if you know for sure that your daughter is, is doing or almost doing something like this, you need to sit with her and educate her and un make her understand. The same for your son. He has to realize that this is a damage. Let's take, a, for instance, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was uh, addressed on this subject by a young man. He came and he said, I want to do, have sex. He said that. And he said, I really want to get involved, do that. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, what about your mother? Would you like somebody to do this with your mother? No. Would you like somebody doing this with your sister? No way. Mm. So with your daughter? No. So the thing you didn't want, you have to realize that every girl is somebody's mother or daughter or sister. And so because you wouldn't want it for your own, you have to realize they wouldn't either. And the education has to come from a young age. Well, there's more. Straight away. The Prophet, peace be upon him, prayed for him. And you know, ever after that, the most hated thing to that boy was anybody to be involved in illicit sexual acts. He really didn't ever do it, nor did he like it anymore after that. So this is a sign to us to pray for them, to bring it out of them, let, hear what they have to say, and then pray for them. Say, I'm praying to Allah to make it so that this is something that you would not do that you won't harm yourself. Because there are diseases spread. Oh my God, the diseases that are that. spread. One of the things I saw in a program once, uh, some Muslim sisters were talking about this, that they had discovered that when a boy has intercourse with a girl who's had with other men, there's a big chance that he can gain a, a disease from her. He can get a disease of different types they discussed. But if a boy is, it goes to a virgin girl, there's no possibility for it. And they elaborated on that to the extent it convinces you the idea of a virgin and a virgin being together is the best. And that's what Allah intended. And this is what Islam is showing us to get married first. And then, of course, stay with that wife and be true to her and to the husband the same way. There's a lot of misconceptions. A lot of people think that we're against sex and they don't realize that after marriage it's completely different. There's no sex without marriage in Islam, yeah. simply put.
Okay, we've run out of time again. Thank you so much for watching this show of Misconceptions and the Punishments of Islam. I'm sure we could have kept on going on. There's so much more to talk about. Inshallah, in the next episode, uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You ask me who my prophet is, I will say, haven't you heard? His name is Muhammad. A mercy to the world, a mercy to the world. If you ask me who my enemy is, I will say, don't you know? If you ask me who my enemy is, he's that same old devil, that same old devil.